Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. So why don't we go to Dr. Dan Reddy and the talk for today. I think this is a really good topic that comes up a lot. There's a lot of controversies, so I'm very eager to hear it myself. So the topic is really about prevention of herpes zoster. So a 37-year-old man with stage 3 HIV, initial CD4 count of 76 and a viral load initially of 170,000. He just started dolutegravir plus tenofovir amtricitabine three weeks before and presented as a walk-in to the clinic with a painful rash. And as you can imagine, this was quite painful. Had never had this before. And so you appropriately prescribe him valacyclovir TID for 10 days for this infection. And he asks you, how can this be prevented in the future because he doesn't want to experience this ever again? And so which would, of the following would you offer? After he finishes this prescription that you've given him for the infection, what would you offer him in the future? Nothing and say, well, it just can't be prevented. Or would you give him a cyclovir 400 BID prophylaxis or lifelong prophylaxis potentially after completing his treatment course? Or would you give him the zoster vaccine? So let's hear what people would do. Okay, so a split here. Most of you would give him a cyclovir for prophylaxis. So let's talk about what we could do. And there is really not a right answer in this situation, I think. And so let's talk about this. So what we know about herpes zoster in patients with HIV is that patients with HIV definitely have higher rates on the order of 12 to 17 fold higher incidence. And even with patients on a highly active antiretroviral therapy, the incidence of zoster is still higher than in the general population, so two to three-fold higher than in HIV-negative persons. And we also know that rates are actually higher, incidence rates are actually higher immediately after ART initiation, so in the first month or two after ART initiation. And probably many of you have actually seen either VZV or HSV reactivation during that immediate post-heart start period as essentially immune reconstitution phenomena. So in terms of, you know, if you don't do anything, we know the rates are pretty high, but what about acyclovir prophylaxis? And so many of you saw Ruan last week who was talking about menopause, but this is actually her paper. She couldn't make it today, I guess, but this is a paper that was she recently published stating that acyclovir prophylaxis does reduce incident zoster in patients. So I wanted to go through this study a little bit and talk about the data behind this and how it might be clinically applicable. Currently, it's not in any guidelines to recommend acyclovir for uh, VZV prophylaxis. We do it for HSV prophylaxis, and there were data from pre previously prior to more liberal ART guidelines to potentially use acyclovir to reduce viral loads modestly, and we can talk about that a little bit. But So this data from this study comes from a large study that was actually done a while back that you may remember, which was looking at the use of acyclovir for reducing transmission of HIV in HSV, HIV co-infected patients. So what it was is patients had, were documented to have had HSV before, and they were HIV positive, and it was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in patients who were actually not on ART. At that time, the CD4 counts were below 250 to start a ART or to have an AIDS-defining illness. So these were patients who did not fit that stage three criteria and were therefore not on antiretroviral therapy. And to give them either a cyclovir 400 BID or nothing, or placebo, um, to look at the primary outcome in this study, originally when done, was to look at incident HIV infections, and we know that that study was actually negative. What we did find is that there was a modest reduction in viral load and a decreased HSV, you know, clinical manifestations of HSV, but no reduced transmission of HIV. But they went back and looked at this study and looked at actually incident zoster cases. And so that's what I'm gonna report on here. Ruan's study specifically look at incident VZV reactivation, either by exam at the quarterly visits or by self-report, and they were educated on what zoster clinically would manifest as. So there were actually a fair number of patients in this study. This was a very large study, so 1,600, over 1,600 in the treatment group as well as in the placebo group. 
and two-thirds of the participants were actually women. Median age was 32, and as you can imagine, the CD4 count was actually quite high because they were not on ART at the time of enrollment. Prior to the enrollment in the study, there was a 4% incidence of herpes zoster in both of the groups, so not insignificant numbers of zoster at baseline. And 1% actually had VZV clinically on baseline <coughs> exam at the time of enrollment. Adherence was really high by pill count and self-report. The study was a multinational study in Africa, and so this was a, a very high adherence rate in, amongst these participants. So what was the meat of the results here? There were 95 incident cases of herpes zoster during the study, which had a median follow-up of about 20 months. 26 events in 22 patients in the acyclovir arm, which is one case per 100 person years incident rate, and 69 events in 64 patients in the placebo arm. So effectively, what the authors are stating here is that acyclovir prophylaxis decreased incident herpes zoster by 62%. But there are a few caveats to this study that I wanted to bring up and that may be very relevant to this patient that we're talking about and to many of the patients that we see. First, this is just the Kaplan-Meier plot that really shows that there was a, a dramatic reduction in the patients who were in the treatment group versus the placebo group. <laughs> the caveats are that acyclovir did not prevent herpes zoster in patients with prior episodes. And that's really important to note, that it actually had no effect. So the patients who were getting it in the treatment group were actually patients who had had it previously <coughs> prior to enrollment. And that suggests that there was possibly a specific VZV T cell immune deficit in these patients, that they're more likely to get VZV reactivation even with acyclovir prophylaxis. The authors suggest that they may need higher doses of acyclovir for prevention, but it's hard to say. There hasn't been a study to really look at that in this group. And also the biggest thing is that no patients with low CD4 counts or AIDS-defining illnesses were included in the study because they would have been receiving heart and therefore not included in this study, which was originally designed to look at transmission rates. So many of our patients who are at risk or who had VZV in the past, we actually don't know if acyclovir would be helpful in, the, in this patient or in other patients that we see that are at higher risk. So the jury's still out. And the guidelines haven't been changed yet in the OI guidelines to include acyclovir for primary prevention of herpes zoster, because that's what we would be talking about, is primary prevention of VZV reactivation. So like I said, it's unclear. As I've talked about before, the zoster vaccine, this is actually a slide from David, that shows that it's quite efficacious in the in, in initial study that was published in 2005, although it excluded HIV-infected patients. So this is really based on data from immunocompetent patients who are older, so age greater than 60, and is the basis for the ACIP recommendations. What I wanted to highlight is some newer data, and these are the 2008 ACIP recommendations, but as many of you know, there was an ACIP position paper that just came out to specifically address the discrepancy between the FDA approval and the ACIP recommendation. So as many of you know, the FDA approval for this vaccine is for 50 and over, but the ACIP recommendations are for 60 and over. We know that it's contraindicated for patients with CD4 counts less than 200, but there is a blank in the recommendations for what to do if they're over 200. It just has no recommendation. And the only guidelines that actually state to consider it are in the HIV primary care guidelines by Judith Aberg and Joel Galan are the primary authors on that that came out, I think, last year or the year before that recommend considering it for age greater than 60 with a CD4 count greater than 200. There are no other guidelines that really clearly state any kind of recommendation for patients with CD4 counts greater than 200 who are HIV infected. As we've talked about before, there was this abstract from three years ago now that we still have not seen published as a paper, so we can't really base any recommendations on it, but it was found in this abstract to be safe and immunogenic in patients with CD4 counts greater than 200 who are virologically suppressed. So what I'm alluding to here is about the 50 to 59 age group. It really is, for people with HIV infection, as you can tell, this guy was 30, 30 something years old, 37. Most of our patients we're gonna see are not gonna be included over 60 to be at, to, in this group. But we know that incident rates are so high even in our younger patients. So we just really don't have any data to guide us. 
I just wanted to bring this up because it's in the media right now and since it was just released, but looking at incident herpes zoster in immunocompetent patients at least, you can see that the incidence really rises with age. So that age 60 to over, even though it's FDA approved for that 50 group. And this is even progressing to post-herpetic neuralgia. The rates are really much higher in that 60 and over group rather than in that 50 to 59 group. And looking at hospitalization rates, you can see that it really climbs up after 60. And 74% of the herpes zoster related hospitalizations are in patients over 60. So really making an argument that the 50 to 59 age group is not really the one we necessarily want to target. And we can see the vaccine coverage rates have sort of steadily marched up with more marketing and more awareness of the vaccine. And then in terms of no vaccination and the post-herpetic neuralgia rates you can see in red is pretty high. And then with the 70 and 60 age groups, it's considerably lower. But if you actually look at vaccination at age 50, the rates are actually close to no vaccination. And the thought is that there's actually some waning immunity. So you may be doing your patient a disservice by giving it earlier. And that I wanted to bring this up because that speaks to people with HIV. If we start vaccinating people earlier, what does that mean for their immunity? And do they need to be repeat vaccinated? We don't know. So if you do vaccinate this gentleman, which I think not, uh, actually not very many of you uh, wanted to do that strategy, would you revaccinate him at some point down the future? And what would that interval be? It's unknown. We know in terms of cost effectiveness, it's much more cost effective to vaccinate people later than earlier. I always have to include that for as part of a vaccine talk. So this is actually the current ASIP recommendations. They affirmed that 60 and over, and they justified why it's still 60 and over, even though the FDA approval is for 50 and 59. And for patients who insist on being vaccinated at low, at that 50 to 59 age group, that duration of protection is unknown. So in terms of our patients, we know that if you don't do anything, this person does have a higher rate of VZV incidence. And many of you said, well, you can't do anything. And that may be the case. And it may be we could use acyclovir, but maybe not. If he's had prior disease, are we really going to affect any change? Or would you use a higher dose of acyclovir? Unclear. And then again, we know that it's not safe with patients with less than 200 CD4 counts, but we don't really know much more about patients over 200, how efficacious it is, and if it would need to be repeated. So I don't think I've clarified anything for you as the point of this talk. I think there is, it's basically one big gray zone, and I know that when we've talked about vaccination before that some of you in the network have been doing zoster vaccines for patients greater than 200, and there isn't a right or wrong answer. It's just that what age group would be appropriate is an unknown because we know that incident rates are higher even at lower age groups in people with HIV. And then the repeat vaccination issue is also unknown. So I would love to hear your thoughts about how you're using Zostafax or if you've been using acyclovir prophylaxis for VZV prevention, VZV reactivation prevention.